If you're a small business owner looking to grow or expand your business, check out On Deck Business Loans. On Deck offers business loans online from $5,000 to $500,000, and their simple application process only takes 10 minutes. Unlike banks, they'll give you a decision quickly, and funding is as fast as one day. Get a free consultation with an On Deck loan advisor. Visit ondeck.com slash podcast. This is the Breakfast Leadership Podcast. Boundaries or burnout, you make the choice. Here's your host, Michael Levitt. Welcome to another episode of the Breakfast Leadership Podcast. I've got Dr. Kristen Sosalski on the line with us. How are you doing today, doctor? Uh, I'm doing great. You can call me Kristen. Thank you. Oh, okay. I, I, I always start off with doctor. I worked in the healthcare space for over a dozen years and yeah it would be weird for me to address some of those people by their first name but I always ask so okay. well I'm not that kind of doctor so. <laughs> awesome. well, th- thank you Kristen so you wrote a book recently and you've you've published other things as well but uh, recently you've released a book data visualization made simple and one of the things we talked about just before we get started was we are inundated with information so many things that we can look at but we haven't made it easy yet on, on being able to decipher all that information in a way that we can use it and also grow from it, learn from it, and make decisions about it. So what prompted you to write the book? And more importantly, what were some of the things that you discovered along the way? Absolutely. So what prompted me to write the book was uh, I teach data visualization and when you Stern School of Business. And my MBA students uh, continuously challenged me. And as, as I was teaching the course, you know, we go over some technical skills and how to, how to visualize data and, and gain insights and all the kind of um, everything that you hear about data visualization. We do in my class, right, data visualization for storytelling. But this was like, you know, five, six years ago. And naturally, my MBA students were like, well, how do we use this in business? Are there some business cases? And it prompted me to say, you know what, what I need to do is go out there in the field and take those, you know, take examples from, um, you know, my, my own consulting and my own practice and really share those with the world, right? So how do business professionals use data visualization, not just as a tool to present information, but really as a leadership skill? And that was really my quest to write this book. So it's filled with case studies of businesses who's, who've used visualization in their practice, how they've used it, the alternative, uh, that really, that, that long page of, you know, numbers and, and, and columns and rows, uh, in addition to some vignettes where people just kind of talk about some of the problems they faced with uh, working with data and how visualization has been a way for them to, you know, communicate more effectively and learn much more about their data. Well, one of the challenges I faced in my decade-long career in healthcare is you get all of this information, you know, patient information, stats, whatnot, and being able to decipher it and figure out, number one, are any of the programs and services that we're doing actually making an impact on the outcomes of patient health, for example? Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm guessing in in the business side of things, and and we know that business is more um, competitive than it's ever been because the playing field has been evened out uh, for the most part in, in many industries is, you know, how can businesses, you know, take that information and, and make the right decisions before it's too late. So I'm, I'm guessing you found some really interesting stories along the way as you were working with businesses, as they figured out, how do I make a sense of all of these numbers that, you know, normally we, we received on an Excel spreadsheet. Absolutely, absolutely. And really the finding is that many of these businesses are creating um, more like dashboard displays or interactive displays that allow for this data exploration process to happen. And then that furthermore allows for the data sharing process to happen. Because now we have an interface that we can understand, not just a set of rows and columns with variables that we have no idea what they mean, but we can show that in the context of um, of, of, of some rich insights um, to prompt people to further explore and understand, you know, the performance of, of various programs and, and the like. What were some surprises that you encountered along the way when you, you jumped from, you know, the, the academic side of things and the studies that you did to the, the business world? Were there anything or any discoveries that, you know, that kind of caught you off guard that you didn't expect to discover? 
Uh, absolutely, that there are not really people in roles, you know, labeled, you know, data visualization specialists or anything that, you know, are doing these things, right? So this is part of someone's job. And that was something that um, seems really intuitive. Uh, but a lot of times from the, from the business perspective, you know, creating, you know, charts and graphs doesn't seem, you know, that sophisticated of a task. But when you put it in the context of leadership, it is the most powerful thing that you can do. If you can communicate your message, if you can sell your idea, and you can provide evidence with data graphics, you are really on the right track. I know in your book, you, you talk about, you know, there's 30 types of charts. Now, many of us are used to, you know, the pie graph and some bars and things like that. But what were some of those charts? And, and, and uh, did you discover any of them worked better with a certain type of group versus another type of organization? It's really a great question. So I present 30 different types of charts, uh, more so to um, illustrate that there are a lot of choices that you have to make as what I call a visualization designer. So anyone who creates data graphics, I call them, you know, a visual designer. And the data, first off, really dictates the type of display that you can select. So if you have categorical data, you're dealing with bar charts, maybe horizontal, maybe column, maybe bullet charts to show performance. Um, if you uh, don't have a time element to your data, you really can't use time series charts, right? So that line chart doesn't work unless you have some element of time you're trying to show. And, um, you know, other things that, that learning along the way are, even though one of the first things that you know one tends to do when when working with data is that you look at some summary statistics but the visualization those visualizations that show those summary statistics like density plots and histograms and box plots aren't that audience friendly um you know if i if i'll talk to an audience without training in in statistics um it's very easy for folks to confuse a histogram with a bar chart or not know what the center line means in a box plot and so understanding your audience and their level of literacy with some of the basic data graphics is super important. Um, also learn that uh, when you have multivariate data, so working with two or more variables uh, that might be continuous, let's say, uh, there are a lot of robust types of displays, right? You can do, you probably have heard of things like the radar chart or parallel coordinates or like these scatter plot matrices, heat maps. Um, all these types of charts are wonderful for data exploration. But when you're asking, when you're showing them on the screen with, you know, 10, 15, 20 variables, it can be quite overwhelming. And so that's where you need a really good narrative and really good explanations along with your charts. You can't just expect them to kind of sell themselves. I remember my statistics class way, way, way back. And all I can remember was the professor wore these bright red pants. And I remember mean, median, and mode. I mean, other than that, it's a, a vacant memory for me. But one of the things that, I, that you mentioned and you alluded to a little bit about um, the visuals and things like that is data tells a story. And if it's on a spreadsheet or printed off report, that doesn't come out, but through the graphics and visual information, you can actually tell a story about what's going on with the organization. And I think that's probably how you connect with, with people that are used to looking at those Excel spreadsheets, especially in the business world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, it starts with, um, you know, a line of inquiry right? Like a question. <laughs> so what categories of products are purchased in the same shopping cart? Right. So if that's if that's my business, um, that that can help me, you know, classify different what we call like shopping missions and be able to identify these different, you know, patterns that our customers have and can affect, you know, even how we uh, stock or stock our inventory, for instance. And so or rethink merchandising. So there's a lot of um, impact for um, of, of being able to find answers to these questions that um that are that can be opaque when just looking at you know the data set with any without any kind of clear um, idea. Well, it's a great analogy you put in as far as you know inventory. You know, I, I think about you know I'm based out of Toronto and the downtown area is just booming with construction of new condo buildings. However, office space and commercial you know businesses and shops there are not as many of them there. And the ones that do exist, grocery stores, for example, are a much smaller footprint than what we grew up with. 
and I, I could see that you know using this technology and this information could allow those grocery stores to say, okay, through our understanding of the information, we can make the right call on what inventory we should carry at this particular store without seeking expansion of the space or anything like that because we've all been in these mega grocery stores that are just massive mm -hmm. and you know that there's inventory there that eventually they're going to have to rotate out because it's not selling mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. they don't need to store that much uh, and so in it's amazing you know the the technology and the usage of 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 this information that is going to make organizations that are smart enough to use it uh, be able to not only survive but thrive and and we see that and you know we'll pick on the retail for an instance in the retail stores you're really struggling and you know there's many every right around every christmas we we always wonder okay who's going to be gone come january and usually there's a couple of them that that vanish in shopping malls and all of the stuff that we hear about in the news all the time so this information for those organizations is going to be crucial for them to make the right choices as far as okay, what size of store should they be operating when they either downsize or relocate? You know, do they need the big mega size store or can they go with something a little bit smaller and still be profitable? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, obviously having a great command of, you know, uh, great understanding of your demand history and uh, and then this the, this current space that you're operating uh, within now with competitors and online shopping and how how that's you know affected your particular business and what new things can you do to you know drive those you know conversions or purchases. So an organization comes to you and says we need help with our our information. We we have all of this information, but we have no idea what to do with it. What are some of the first steps without giving away the kernel secret recipe, of course? You know, what are some of the things that you do when you when you work with an organization? We start with um, establishing a data practice, first and foremost. So um, you know, everything from data governments, who has access to it and when and how, how does that work? Um, who's trained on being able to use it and access it? Um, and then who has the greatest understanding of the data that, that the organization has. And so we want to kind of paint that picture of like all the data that's, that's available. Um, and then, then start thinking about any kind of data that, you know, you think you may need, but you don't have yet. And when you start thinking about those questions, it's not about more data collection. It ends up being about much more analysis. It's metrics that we don't yet have, but maybe we have the data to get there. Um, and then it's really about taking the, um, devising a set of then business questions and working with IT, working with management, and if necessary, building a data collection plan for any new data that we may need to get. Maybe it's, we're looking, we want social media data, but we just don't have it, right? We know it's out there. We know we can get it, but we just don't have it in, in our systems or in our data warehouse, as an example, or database. Um, and then once you have that and you have guidelines for collection and sharing, creating a plan of action. Um, you know, I'm a big proponent of democratizing access to data and insights, um, but you want to decide, you know, who has that, who has that access and then return back to those, you know, particular driving questions, um, and define measurable outcomes for this kind of, you know, whether you call it a data experiment or whether you call it, um, okay, we're going to include visualization as part of our practice. And to get there, we need to make sure that we have the right data and we give people the tools to, um, to analyze it and to, to show it. And so that re requires, of course, some training. Um, and so we like to, uh, um, you know, train, you know, the entire organization, um, but do it by, you know, business units or by, by question, by large sets of questions, bring a bunch of experts in the room and then build a culture of use in an organization, designate champions, um, and uh, use visuals in, in everyday practice, not just for, you know, when you meet with clients, but in showing, um, you know, even what's happening right now in the business. Um, try to use graphics so uh, more people around the table can really have a better and clearer understanding of what's happening, even though they may not know exactly what's happening in your business unit or know, you know, the scope of that. Does that make sense? Oh, well, it makes perfect sense. And it's amazing work. I, I'm a, I'm a systems guy. I like infrastructure. I like, you know, having a complete understanding of you know, what's going on with the organization. You know, what are the opportunities and all of that, and and being able to take information and and present it and and analyze it in such a way where you can make. 
the right decision and be confident with it, with, with the information. And of course, get everybody else on board with understanding it too, because that's one of the biggest challenges and correct me if I'm wrong, Mm -hmm. that you run into with organizations is there's so many components of the organization, whether it's departments, silos, whatever you want to call them, that really don't have a complete understanding of what the organization is doing. Even though they know we are this organization, we do this, they don't really understand how all the pieces work together and how one department dramatically impacts another based on their performance, which then turns around and impacts everybody. So um, I, I, love, I love the work that you're doing and, and, and this information because, again, I, I know that as the world gets more and more smaller uh, when it comes to you know, the global reach, it, we we need to have really concrete, accurate information so organizations can look ahead and see where things could potentially go wrong, which would have been really beneficial for the economic recession back in 08, if you think about it, because if organizations were aware of what was going about to happen, mm-hmm. it could have alleviated a lot of that pain and discomfort that so many went through. And, and that's, again, another thing with, with having the information, you can make those preemptive adjustments uh, to determine, okay, we need to maybe downsize this department or maybe look at a different line, but look ahead of the game instead of trying to fix it when you're halfway down the road. Reactively. Correct. Yeah. I'm I'm totally with you with that. Um, And then, I mean, I would say that I agree with everyone, everything that you said. And then in addition, like if you think about how to use data as your evidence, So, you know, there's a lot of organizations out there that, you know, won't, you know, allow you to present an idea unless you actually have data to back it up, that it might be actually a good idea for the organization to implement. Um, And so the idea is that um, if we're able to use charts and graphs um, as internal communication tools, as ways to kind of showcase the cause and effect of our efforts. Let's say that we've just launched a new marketing campaign and be able to show the cause and effect of that and how that's much different than what happened last time or last year. Um, then you get, you can get many more voices around the discussion of those efforts and, um, and, and help make those strategic decisions. Yeah, it's it, it's a great, great analogy because, like you said, you know, some people say we're not going to look at anything unless you can provide evidence that we need to have it. And being able to present it in such a way where the management, senior leadership, stakeholders, whomever you're presenting to can visually understand the information you're providing. Because oftentimes, and I've been through many of these, and I'm sure you have too, where you get this presentation, they've got all the stats and all of that. And at the end of it, you, you still don't understand, okay, what are they asking for? Or how will this do this? And by utilizing, you know, the stuff that you line out in your book and, you know, the, the, the techniques that you use, that helps reduce that from happening to everyone at the end of it has a clear understanding of where things are, what they want to do, and, and how it'll be impactful for the organization. Absolutely. There's actually a chapter in my book called the presentation <laughs> and um, it's, it's followed by a chapter called the audience. And while these are not data visualization terms, right, but it's really important to know the medium in which you're presenting and then the audience that you're presenting to. Um, and so just to give you some um, contrasting situations. So imagine if you're creating a paper report and you won't be in front of the people reading that paper report, right? Or the PDF report. In this case, you have to use words to really explain what's going on and then use the charts as evidence and then, you know, really explain what what the features of the chart mean and in words kind of say, okay, if you look at the green bar here, this represents, you know, uh, you know, forecasted sales as opposed to kind of what happened last year, which you see in the gray bar, right? You have to be very explicit and not just say, just assume because you're, you have the data as evidence, right? This is taking that one step further that it will be interpreted the same way. Um, and so in, in my book, I talk a lot about, you know, um, doing, doing drafts of your data graphics, right? Cause what you do today will look very different tomorrow and you'll probably be a big critic of your work <laughs> of yesterday and want to improve it today. And if you uh, take the time to share your data graphics with colleagues, just to say, what do you see in this chart? What is it telling you? 
And if you ask two people and they have different answers, maybe you need to go back and rework that or you need a great explanation for it. And so these are some of the things that we talk about um, that help that kind of pre-work before you actually present those data graphics because you really want to be kind to your audience. Sometimes we tend to load up PowerPoint decks with a ton of information, right? I'm sure you've been there. Um, and it's a lot to get through. And then we feel like we're just getting through content instead of telling a story or having a clear beginning, middle or end or having a real takeaway. Um, that we can leave the audience with or a call to action. Yes, I have been a victim of PowerPoint karaoke more than once. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's one of those things where anymore, even like if I go on to a webinar and, you know, they start talking and I'm like, okay, they're reading word from word. And I'm like, okay. And you look, it's like, can I download the slide deck? And if I can, I do it. And then I eject from the webinar because mm -hmm. I'm not going to miss anything because everything they're going to talk about is in the slide deck. So, no, it's good to utilize uh, PowerPoint sparingly and, and let the conversation and the information share itself for sure. Yeah. And, and really like slow down your explanations of, you know, the most important part of your presentation, which will be the evidence, let's say, right. Those data graphics, you know, maybe don't show the whole graphic at once. Use like progressive disclosure, show, show the first part, then the second part. And then that will give you some time to actually say something uh, as the chart is being shown on the screen. And so you really want to think about the relationship between what you say and then what's being shown. No, that's spot on advice. And I, I made a note of that myself to remind myself of that as I present different things, because sometimes we, we, we just fly through it and like, wait a minute, this is the, this is the, the climax of the story. We probably should spend a little bit of time <laughs> on this and, and talk about it a little bit more. So Kristen, I've enjoyed our conversation today and I love the, the work that you're doing and, and, um, thankful that this book is out because again, I think it's going to be world changing for organizations that take advantage of utilizing um, this way of approaching information to really discern what's going on with their organization now and in the future. So where can people find out more about you? They can find out more about me. Um, feel free to connect with me on Twitter. It's just my last name at Sosolsky, S-O-S-U-L-S-K-I. They can also um, connect with me on my website, kristensosolsky.com. Awesome. An audience will have that information in the show notes. So Great. Kristen, thank you again for being you and for all the awesome work that you're doing. And uh, thanks again for being on the show. Oh my gosh, it was a ton of fun. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. And until next time, everybody, be well. Hey, it's Michael again. Thank you for listening to the podcast. I really appreciate it. If you're like many people, you're dealing with some significant stress and possibly approaching burnout. I know how you feel. In 2009, my burnout led to a year of worst-case scenarios. I do not want that to happen to you. If you go to breakfastleadership.com, you can register for a free webinar on burnout prevention, as well as get a free checklist to have successful mornings. Start off each day the right way. Again, that's at breakfastleadership.com. Also, since you are a loyal podcast listener, I'm asking you to like, rate, and review my podcast on iTunes. I look at all the reviews and appreciate your comments, and it helps other potential listeners discover the content I have on the show. I appreciate you, and thanks again for listening.